Hey everybody, this is Ray again with Iraq Veteran 8888, Moss Pawn and Gun, and today for Sonoran Desert Institute. We're going to disassemble and reassemble the classic model 29 Smith & Wesson revolver in 44 Magnum. This particular model happens to be one of their classic DX lines. This was a gun that was picked due to its um, inherent accuracy. It came off the line and was specially hand-picked because these will shoot roughly inch and a half groups, which is about twice as accurate as the average 29 coming off the line. They, um, as you can see, this one does not have a rear sight on it. Uh, we bought this gun used. Uh, Chad actually picked it up recently. And it had a uh, scope mount on it, but um, we're not too keen on the scope mounts for these things. So we're just gonna replace the rear sight on it. Um, as soon as we can find one that fits that. Otherwise, we're going to disassemble this gun. The only difference is the rear sight just requires one screw to come out of the top here, and it just slides out with a little T-slot nut that it's got. All right. First thing you're going to want to do is, of course, check it, make sure it's unloaded. Push the thumb latch forward, swing the cylinder out, and check all of the charge holes, and be certain that she's unloaded. Next thing to do is going to be to remove the grip. All right, I think what we're gonna do here is just remove this hogue grip. This is actually one that uh, they made for Smith & Wesson with the Smith & Wesson logo, but it is made by Hogue, so it comes off and on just like their standard mono grip, just a single screw in the bottom, and then you just pull it away from the gun. That's it. On this, it's got a little stainless, or a little spring stirrup, and just pry it off either side, and it comes off the bottom like so. As you can see, this particular model has a rounded frame like most of the newer guns do. The um, next thing we're going to do is release the tension on the mainspring with that screw. I'm going to switch our bits out here. And this is called a strain screw. I'm going to put that here on our U.S. Gun Mat Corporation magnetic mat. Once that's loose, the uh, main spring can be taken out, and it's a flat style spring. There are a couple of different designs on these. You'll find this one to be the most common with the two finger hooks like that. When you get inside the gun, you'll be able to see what style of actual stirrup that it has on the hammer. All right, we're going to take the um, side plate screws out now. All right, the front screw is going to have a plunger and spring arrangement, and that is to retain the crane assembly. Once that front screw's out, you can push your latch forward, rotate the cylinder and crane assembly out, and then slide that whole unit out. The crane and the cylinder assembly will come apart. We'll set those aside now because later we are going to disassemble that cylinder a little bit farther. The crane is manufactured as one piece, although there are numerous pieces within that. You've got the two different shafts and tube assembly, and those are permanently affixed to that as an assembly. So if that's ever damaged, to some degree they can be straightened, but if they're really badly damaged, they have to be replaced. All right, we'll go back to this side and take these other screws out on the side plate. Just put firm downward pressure on these because they can be tight. Definitely don't want to slip and scratch the frame on one of these. Make sure that your bits fit very firmly inside the slots. And about 80% as wide as the head of the screw, you don't necessarily want to go full width because it'll scratch the inside of the hole. So you want that to be just slightly under the width of the screw. All right, to get the side plate off of this, you're going to strike the gun's frame underneath the grip panels where you won't mar it. Get you a nylon hammer or a tool such as this. Hold your thumb over the side plate and then just give the frame a whack. What that'll do is the inertia will allow the um, side plate to walk off. Just lift that up 
inspect the underside there to make sure there's no major damage. Once you get that part off, you can see the inner workings of the firearm. You've got the transfer bar that just floats back and forth here, and on this little slot, there's a small stud that is raised on the rebound slide that that sits on top of. So you're just gonna lift that off. Set that here. Now with that out of the way, you can see when you cycle the gun, you'll have to push the thumb latch to the rear. You can see how it intercepts the back of the hammer. So to get the hammer to come back, you can push the thumb latch. And you can take a look. If you've never taken one of these apart before, do this a few times to become familiar with the inner workings of the gun. Just kind of make sure that each of the pieces stay flat down against the inside of the frame while you're doing that so that they don't come apart. And you can just see the way that they work. Sear in a face here, the rebound slide, how it returns the trigger using the uh, little strut there. And this particular hammer has the small strut coming off of it that's the I would call it an intermediate design. Uh, there are newer ones now that are milmed, but these are all forged parts, so that's kind of a plus on this gun. To get the hammer out of the frame, you're going to want to go ahead and cock it back and then pull the trigger to release it from the sear engagement area. And once it's freely moving like that, make sure you have clearance on your hammer nose and your frame and make sure that the sear engagement area clears behind the actual hand where it goes through the frame window. So once that's taken out of the frame, just set that aside here and you can slowly release the trigger. The next part we're going to remove is going to be the rebound slide and its spring. You're going to need a rag or some other item to retain the spring when it pops out. This is a specialty tool that Brownells sells. It's a slotted dog legged affair. What that allows you to do is compress the spring in the rebound slide while the slot leaves clearance for the stud that retains the spring and guides the rebound slide. So what I'm actually going to do is push in and lift up and you can see how that just kind of lifts up a little bit. So I'm going to cover it so that the spring doesn't go away and we're going to pop that loose. All right, as you can see, that item came right out. You've got the rebound slide, rebound slide spring, and this pin is the over travel stop. That is actually what causes the trigger to stop. So this is something you're gonna to wanna to keep up with. You can adjust that length on there if you have different needs, you can leave it out. It doesn't really hurt anything. But um, these are some of the items that are used to enhance the trigger pull. If you were to want to lighten the trigger pull, you would replace this spring as well as the main spring. Other ways you can lighten the trigger pull is by narrowing the spring slightly on its sides on the main spring. You can even turn and polish the outside diameter of these springs as long as you have a mandrel that fits inside the spring and you want to sand it at a, uh, about 45 degrees um, to the spring and then polish it thoroughly so you don't have any stress risers if you do that. Once the uh, rebound slide is out, the next thing is going to be to remove the trigger assembly as well as the hand assembly. To do that, you're going to fold the hand back like so and you can either go ahead and lift the hand out or you can pick up the whole hand and the trigger assembly as a unit like that. If you're careful, you can get it out as one unit. The main thing you don't want to do is let this snap forward while you're taking it out because it'll leave a nasty gouge on the recoil shield. It'll be very obvious too. It'll be a nice little shiny scratch mark right there as you can see where it would interface with that frame. So be careful with that. On some of these newer triggers, this little shaft that pushes the rebound slide back just slides in there. So if you pick the trigger up, this unit can just fall out. This particular model, it's pinned in place. The newer ones are MIM parts and they just slip into place. So that's one item that you can easily lose if you're not careful. Um, to get the hand out, you just pull up. There's a small hairspring underneath there. That hairspring 
rests on the short stud that comes out of the bottom of the hand. This is your pivot, the larger one, and this is your actual uh, torsion uh, arm, I guess you would call it, or the stud for the torsion spring that keeps it forward. Basically the spring lays on it like so, forces it forward like that. Set these aside for now. As far as driving the pins out of this trigger, it's not really recommended unless you have a broken part that needs to be replaced because they are in there tightly. It's easy to mar them and I don't recommend taking them out unless it's absolutely necessary. We're not going to do that today. At this point you've still got the bolt and you've got the latch assembly. The cylinder bolt is spring loaded. There's a pocket in the frame and the spring also sits in a small pocket in the actual bolt. To get this item out, what you're going to have to do is depress this below the frame's window and then lift it out. And it's sometimes a tight fit, so you might have to work on it a little bit. But once you get it going, don't try to pry it heavily, just a little bit at a time. All right, as you can see, it's starting to work its way up. Once it gets to the point where it's about to release, you're going to want to cover this again with your shop rag so that that small spring doesn't get away from you and just continue to lift up and just wiggle it lightly and it'll come right out. Once the spring is out, the uh, rest of it just lifts out of place. Pretty straightforward. You can see the pocket and the small spring that fits in that pocket. It's not retained in there by any means, so just go ahead and separate the two items and place them here on your mat or in a um, little secure box. This is an item that, wants, that you want to inspect pretty closely because when these guns get abused, the cylinders get slammed open and shut. This will be grabbed by the notches in the cylinder and because this is a very heavy cylinder, it's going to want to push back and forth in the window like that. It can cause damage to the bolt and it can also cause damage to the window. This little item that just fell out is part of the locking mechanism that's on the uh, rebound slide of this particular model. This one, set that right there, just goes up and down in this little window. All right, we're going to turn it over, unscrew the thumb latch, All right, the thumb latch has a nut, and that's just kind of a little hollow slotted nut. Set that aside. The thumb latch itself should just come right off if it's a little bit of a tight fit. This one is. There we go. It came right off. Set that here. Now, the actual thumb latch assembly has a very small plunger and spring that keeps it pushed forward. So what you're going to have to do to get this out is to push it to the rear of the frame and then actually somewhat lift it out because you need the clearance up in the front here. So you're going to have to do that like so and then grab this and lift it out. Sometimes a small tool is necessary. Once you start getting it out of there, that little plunger assembly is going to want to go out, but the shoulder on the frame will allow it to be retained. Once you get to that shoulder on the frame where the side plate sits, just lift it up and let your rag retain that plunger. And you can see how tiny that is. And the spring in it is also quite small. Those items are easily lost, but they're quite necessary for the operation of the gun. So set all these aside. Use your little magnetic parts tray or parts mat like I've got here. These things are great for retaining these small parts. I mean, if you sneeze, it's got enough magnetic tension to keep those parts from flying everywhere. But at the same time, it's not so strongly magnetic that it magnetizes all of your parts. So it's a really nice unit to have. All right, at this point, the only major things that we've still got left on the frame that can be removed, but we generally don't, 
unless there are repairs necessary. The roll pin in the bottom of the frame that aligns the grips or holds the stirrup on for the hogue. And then you got the front cylinder latch plunger. You've got a small um, diameter pin here that's round headed and it's polished to match the rest of the gun. So it's not recommended to drive those out unless you have the absolute perfect punches and generally a good press is necessary because these are tight. They can easily be damaged if you try punching away at these things. So unless this is damaged, I don't recommend taking that out. If it's really crusty and rusty, first try flushing it out ultrasonic it, uh, blow it out with air before you disassemble it because it may not be necessary to do that. And then the front sight. It is also held in the same way by a small diameter hard pin. Uh, again, easily damaged, so unless you're actually needing to change the front side out, don't take it out. If you just need to replace the front insert, don't take it out. You can still replace that insert with any of the kits that are out there on the market. So no reason to take that front sight blade out unless absolutely necessary. The on the um, hammer of this gun, there are numerous components that can be removed and replaced on the hammer as necessary. It's not something that you generally take apart, just to take apart and clean. The hammer nose itself is riveted in place and it can be replaced. It's also got a small spring in it so that the hammer nose has a little bit of room to move back and forth like so. That should always be freely moving. You should feel some spring tension on it. Always check this area on the hammer nose top and bottom to make sure that there's not any undue wear or if it's been dry fired extensively that would show as well. And the same thing on the uh, frame. A lot of times on a gun that has had the spring broken on the hammer nose or the top area of the hammer nose. This little hooded area here, you can't really tell it without having one apart, but the inside is notched for the spring right here. And this area on top is rather thin. If these have, say, a hammered strike that hits something that's in, in between the frame and the hammer nose, it can snap that part off. And what will then happen is the spring will go south and the hammer nose will pivot up higher and you'll oftentimes see damage to the top of the frame in this location here. Uh, that's the first sign of it have at one point or another had a broken hammer nose. The rivets are generally able to be pushed out and reused if you're very careful using the right punch. Otherwise you can purchase the nose and rivet and spring assemblies as you need them. The um, other two components that can come out is the stirrup on this particular hammer, the stirrup is pinned in place. On the newer ones, it just kind of keys into place. It's made uh, on a mem parts type basis, so it actually just keys in and is held in place by its uh, positioning. The other is the um, double action sear. This part, you can see, is spring-loaded as well with a pivot point here. And these areas here and the sear areas here are points that are cleaned up during an action job. They'll be dressed and polished to make for a very smooth trigger pull. The interface is going to be like this. That's the interface that's within the gun. As this picks up, it originally picks up on this and then is carried up and is released. And when it returns, there's going to be a hammer down position. So that has to click back into place like so. And that's the way that setup works. You can get too much play here, which you don't want. Uh, if you overdo the, the polishing on that, this is the cheapest part. Start with that first and get that working good before you polish any of the other areas to any drastic degree. Um, these components are case hardened. That means that they've got a very thin surface hardening area on them. You cannot grind away a lot of material on these when you're working on the triggers or else you will get into soft material and the triggers that are so nice and crisp for a week will not be there a week later. So you gotta be very careful with these. These are only to be lightly stoned and polished, not heavily ground whatsoever. The cylinder consists of a few different components. You've got the actual ejector rod. You've got the cylinder body. You have the extractor star and you've got the plunger, spring, and the center rod. You've also got a collar and an ejector spring inside of that. We're going to disassemble this so you can see those components. To do that, you're going to want to use some dummy rounds. We've got some Azum solid aluminum rounds. 
You can use fired brass, but fill up the charge holes with fired brass or with your dummy cartridges like this. And what we're doing is we're relieving the torque on this extractor star. You don't want it to break off these small aligning pins. They're quite hard to see, but they're very small. They're only about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. And there are two of them. And they're opposing one another inside the cylinder. And those two pins are permanently set. They're not meant to be replaced. If you break one of those off, you've really got to set this thing up in the milling machine and really be careful to bore those out so that you don't get them off because that will throw the timing of your weapon off. But anyway, you throw these in here and then you're going to grab the ejector rod in a wrench that's made specifically for that or padded hard jaws. I use those, that's what I've got handy. But uh, I'll show you how that works. I'm going to go over to the vise. All right, guys, we've got the cylinder clamped up in the vise. As you can see, I've got some hard Delrin jaws to clamp the um, cylinder ejector rod. And these are reverse threaded, so do not start cranking this to the left or else you're going to just snap it off and you're going to be buying some components. So just grab it firmly and just give it a turn to the right clockwise. And this will come unscrewed. Once you get it loose, you can take it out of your vise and put your hand against the back of it and then just continue to loosen it up and take it out and it's going to decompress. All right. I'm going to take these off. Got your ejector shaft and you've got the little collar. You can see the orientation. The large diameter is going to be towards the front of the gun when you reassemble it. You've got the large diameter spring. You've got the ejector center pin and you've got the small diameter spring. There's a small collar or a raised boss actually on the center pin and the spring goes on the long side. doesn't matter it's double ended so you can put the spring on any direction. And then the short end of it is going to go inside and that's what protrudes from your ejector star. Alright, I'm going to set these on the mat. And it just pulls right out. There's a key that's milled in actually to the cylinder itself and a key slot that's milled on the shaft. Those two need to mate up before you try forcing it in there. Some guns are going to have a flat area like on the Colt. There'll just be a flat spot on the actual ejector star and assembly but on the Smith & Wesson they chose to use a groove and stud type arrangement. And that's another thing you don't want this to rotate if this is very tight that's why you put these dummy rounds in there is to take up any of the torque that might be otherwise produced on these two small pins and on that small tooth. The tighter this is as long as it's still got movement the better because when that does not move inside the cylinder that means that your timing is going to stay nice and tight. If you've got an extractor star that moves around a lot in the cylinder you're going to have sloppy timing and that's part of the item that a lot of people overlook when it comes to timing these but it's a very critical point. It can be fixed and remedied but oftentimes when they're real sloppy it's an expensive process. There's a small collar basically this is one that's pressed into the cylinder permanently and it's basically a gas ring to cut down on cylinder blast that gets inside and then those two small alignment studs and that's it. And the rest of this is the one Although this is a multiple piece assembly, it is not meant to come apart and it should not come apart. If it's loose, then it needs to be replaced. A couple things on these guns that um, can be worn with time. One is going to be the amount of cylinder in shake. If you look, if you drop the cylinder inside this frame, there's quite a bit of fore and aft play. Some of that in shake is taken up in a couple of different forms. One is the distance between the um, extractor star and the end of the crane. This is actually your thrust area where the cylinder goes together. It does not stop on the front of the cylinder 
or on the shoulder of the crane. It actually stops here. And that's an adjustment that can be made to reduce or increase the end play if you're working with brand new parts or mismatched parts. But basically this is going to be used to eliminate the fore and aft movement. Once you get your extractor star fitted and your timing uh, good and close, then you're going to adjust and make sure that your cylinder gap and your end play is good. So that on this particular gun is in good condition. There's no need to adjust any of that, but if you're in the you know, shop and you're trying to restore one that's got a lot of play, they make washers or shims, as you will, that fit this circumference and they actually fit down inside the cylinder and sit on the bottom of the cylinder in there and they increase that distance. That works to get rid of the end play, but the big problem is you've probably got some barrel cylinder gap issues then and end play will also cause light strikes if you've got a long reach for the hammer nose to try to get to the cartridge primer. So you want to eliminate end shake. You want the extractor star to be resting up against the frame um, as closely as possible without causing binding. So fixing any of the other major problems like excessive barrel cylinder gap, that generally means replacing the barrel or turning it back a full turn and there's a lot of involvement there because you've got to not only turn the barrel back and time it, but you've also got to shorten the ejector rod slightly to make up for the difference because you've moved everything back a whole turn and you'll have to cut the forcing cone. These guns are generally quite durable. They will take a good pounding and not wear out anytime soon. The main thing that damages these guns are neglect and misuse. Opening and closing the cylinders robustly, slamming them open and shut, spinning them cowboy style, that's that's very bad for any of these guns. All right, now we've got the um, Smith & Wesson all cleaned up. It's already been lightly lubricated. We used a little bit of the LPS2, which is a wet lubricant. Uh, very high quality stuff there. What we're going to start doing is be assembling from the order that we disassembled. So we're going to go ahead and put the cylinder back together first. I'm going to take the extractor, key that in place. It's almost as easy to feel it as it is to look for it, like so. Then you've got your center pin. You've got the center pin spring. It goes over like so. Okay. You've got the ejector spring. You've got your collar. And remember the flange on the collar goes towards the muzzle of the gun, just like so. And then you've got the crane assembly. And you can either leave the crane assembly on or you can use it to help align this rod when you're screwing it all together. That way you don't get anything misaligned. Just remember it's reverse threads, so left is tight, not right. All right, got her tight and back together. Just gonna go ahead and set that aside while we reassemble the rest of the revolver here. We'll flip your frame over. Last thing out was the bolt, so that's going to be the first thing back in. Make sure you get the bolt and the bolt spring. And get that little jewel right here. Goes in just like so. Go ahead and lay it in place like so. Grab yourself a little tool, something you can easily compress that with. I've got this little flat spatula looking thing here that works really good for compressing that little spring and just kind of compress that into the pocket and then down into the frame. Take a little finagling, but it'll go in there. Yep. And then that'll pop up into place inside the window of the frame and just make sure that it moves freely. All right, when we reassemble the trigger, you need to compress the small wire spring so that it sits on that small shaft that's protruding, the short, small diameter one. Install it to the point where the shaft is starting to protrude through the window, and then take a punch that fits in there very nicely and compress the spring. All right, push the hand across and then release the tension by taking the punch out. And you should have tension on the hand. You feel a little bit of spring tension there. 
This particular unit has the longer stud that comes out. What that's gonna do is interface with that little unit right there. It's gonna sit in here like that. And as the trigger moves up and down, this slides in the window and is part of the bolt locking assembly so that it won't come unlatched under heavy recoil. All right, so lay that down in there like so. Make sure that the extension is up as high as it'll go. Put the trigger on the pivot, kind of fold the hand back, and then make sure that it's down into the window slot where it's supposed to go. Okay, like that. And then on the underside here, we're gonna make sure that the little locking bolt is in the right place. There we go. Everything fell into place and you can watch it move up and down like so. Okay. Now, the next piece that's gonna go in is gonna be the rebound slide, the over travel stop, and the rebound slide spring like this. It's basically the orientation that's all gonna go in. And install like so. Make sure the little rounded hole fits correctly on the extension from the trigger. Make sure everything's pushed forward. And I like to use a small diameter punch, just big enough to compress the spring, a little bit larger version than that. And just compress and push the rebound slide and spring assembly down on the retaining stud and just actuate it a couple of times freely to make sure that it's moving well. All right. All right, this is the uh, cylinder latch assembly. You've got the latch bar, you've got the thumb piece itself, the nut that holds it together, and you've got the spring and the plunger that power it back and forth. So we're gonna take these and assemble them as such. The spring goes in that small hole here and then the plunger. These pieces are really easy to lose because they're so small. So once you get that assembled, put it in the gun, in the frame as such, and I'm gonna carefully compress this. And if I do it all correctly, I won't shoot the cameraman in the face. Get that in there. All right, I'm just gonna use the tool to compress this plunger a little bit farther and it'll just drop right into place like such. All right, and before you actuate it, flip it over, put your thumb piece on, and the thumb piece nut. Go ahead and tighten that down. All right, just check it for free function. All right, good to go. Next is gonna be your hammer. Make sure that you compress the trigger all the way. I have to pull the bolt stop back a little bit there. And just lay the hammer in place. Make sure it rotates freely. And then just release the tension on it there. All right. Next, we're gonna go ahead and replace the main spring. We're gonna add that in here just because it's a little easier to see what we're doing. We're gonna pick up on that forked section there and it's gonna hook underneath the little hammer extension and then it's gonna fit down inside the window of the grip frame. There's a small little recess for it to fit in. Just hold a little tension on it there while you get your strain screw started. Go ahead and install that with a little bit of finger tension on it. And then go ahead and flip that up and tighten her down. Strain, strain screws should be tight all the way against their seat in the frame. It is a misnomer to use that as a means of reducing trigger pull because the arch in the spring is meant to be in a certain form. If you reduce the arch, then it's gonna actually cause binding at the rear end of the stroke. 
if the spring's a little bit skewed out of place, just give it a tap. It'll slide over in the window there just fine. All right. Now you can actuate the action here a couple of times just to make sure that everything's moving smoothly. Make sure that your components stay compressed against the inside of that. Do not snap it. Control that hammer in case it's out of place. It won't damage your frame. All right. Next item is going to be the transfer bar. Slips over the stud that's on the rebound slide and should easily slide up and down to block the hammer if the trigger's not pulled correctly. So I slide that all the way down. Your side plate is next. Make sure that you catch the top edge first. Make sure that the hammer block fits in the groove, like so. Now, if it's a very tight side plate, it's gonna require some pressure to get it to go down. What you want to do is make sure that this goes down flush with heavy finger pressure before you start putting the screws to it. Because if it's not down and there's some reason that it's binding, then you're not going to help matters by forcing it by turning the screws in. Sometimes they're really, really tight. But you've got very little bit of, re, of um, excess, so you can generally get that pulled the rest of the way down. Um, you're, Flat-headed screw is the rear top, further most of the rear part of the frame. The longer dome-headed screw behind the trigger. And then the screw with the plunger, which is actually kind of a pointed plunger. It will come out if you pull it and there's a stiff spring underneath it. But what that does is interfaces with the crane, and rides in that groove to keep the crane from jumping out. So we're going to go ahead and assemble the cylinder and crane, like so. Got these others started. And then flip it over. Make sure when you reassemble this, you extend the cylinder slightly. I'm going to make sure that one of the flutes is over the boss here. And gently assemble that. And it should close without any undue force. Should lock right up. And you can go ahead and put your other side plate screw in place now. And we'll start tightening these up. These screws do not have to be torqued super duper tight, but you do want them firm. If the gun's gonna be used under severe duty, if it's a life and liberty gun, maybe you're in Alaska hunting with it, or it's a weapon that you chose to carry on a daily basis, you might consider putting some medium strength Loctite on those threads, but it's not generally necessary. Most of these won't shoot loose for a couple hundred rounds, no matter what kind of abuse. But if they're carried in a holster a lot, it's a good idea to check them regularly. Next thing we're gonna do is put the little stirrup back on that holds the uh, hoe grip. Just basically flare that over the spring pin on the grip. A little bit tricky at times because you really gotta compress it good. There we go. All right, with the um, stirrup hanging down like that, just make sure that it falls into the groove that's in the grip here. And just kind of slip it in there. And it's kind of self-centering once you hit the right place, just slide it on up until it stops. Install the screw. And again, give it just a light tightening. Doesn't require a ton of force. That's it. The only thing we're lacking is a rear sight, which simply enough, you just slide the T-nut in the bottom of this U-shaped slot, and then the retaining screw goes up in the front. That's pretty much it. As you can see, this one's factory drilled and tapped for scope mount, 
which is what was on the gun, but no longer. There we go. Model 29 disassembled, reassembled. Hopefully this will help you guys out. As, um, as you know, Eric and I are now working with um, SDI. We're both instructors. If you guys have any interest in SDI, we offer numerous different courses, uh, gunsmithing, associate's degrees. Uh, we also have AR-15 classes, 80% build classes. And a lot of this stuff you can also use if you're a GI and you have GI bill money. They are fully accredited. And if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to call. The uh, numbers are in the information box below the video here. And if you want to call them, they've got plenty of information for you. Reasonably priced classes and excellent instruction and excellent cur curriculum. So thanks guys for watching and see you soon.